Desiree, I'm so glad to have you on the win today. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's my honor. Desiree, I want to start a conversation right here. You were the Bachelorette season nine of the show. But I want to ask, why are you talking about your story right now? I mean, what, what's important for people to hear from you today? You know, timing is everything. Yes. And even before the show, I wanted to write a book. I have it written down in like 2008, like write a book. And so that was based on just, you know, earlier experiences, mm -hmm. but God really needed me to go through the bachelor bachelorette to offer even more hope and encouragement in what I had to walk through. And I had even more lessons to learn after the show, uh, to be able to really, I don't know, to really be able to be at a place in my life where I am firm in my identity in Christ, that I can now offer that to other people. Because if I wrote my story right after the show, it wouldn't have as much impact in my words, in my lessons learned. Um, I mean, I always say that healed people heal people. Come on. So like I wasn't, I had to, a lot of healing to go through before I could offer any, you know, encouragement to other people. That's really helpful. In fact, it's so interesting that we started right here and you said what you did. I had Michelle Williams from Destiny's Child on the podcast uh, recently, and we were talking about how important it is that our life story and the stories we tell come from scars, but not from open wounds. And the Lord, and I want to say this to everyone listening to the podcast right now, again, you're hearing it from Desiree, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to heal that which we can't seem to heal on our own. Yeah. It's so powerful when he does heal, we have something to offer people that be life. And so healed people heal people. That's really good. Yeah. Desiree. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, it's, it's a lesson I learned, um, yeah. but it's so true. I like what you said too, about the Holy spirit, because I also want to reiterate that you yourself, which I also learned on my own is you can't heal yourself per se. Like, when those wounds and that trauma or those experiences run really deep, the only person that can change you and that can heal you is the Lord. And, and that's through the Holy spirit and that's through prayer. And so I, my whole story is honestly that like, I didn't do anything to help myself except get on my knees and pray. <laughs> like that is the only thing that saved me from, from, you know, the same lies, the same patterns, mm -hmm. um, overcoming strongholds that, that I knew I had, but I didn't, I couldn't like pass, you know, I couldn't like overcome on my own. And so, yeah, I like, I like what you said about that too. <laughs> okay. We got to go off script for a minute because this is really sure. helpful uh, guys. Desiree just said, you can't heal yourself. And one of the things we've been talking about on the show is that willpower driven self-help just does not turn the key on total life transformation. Transformation beats self-help. Desiree, I'd love to hear your thoughts on exactly that willpower determination. You can muster yourself up to nth degree, but it will not turn the key on total life transformation. It didn't for you. Why not? No, it didn't for me in a lot of areas of life, but I also figured this out in business um, because I was, you know, I felt like, oh, you know, I'm doing what God has called me to do because I, it's my dream, you know, the desire of my heart. And so I went about it, but I went about it in my own way, in my own willpower. And it, it, it was a huge you know, it was humbling because the expectation was not what had happened. And that's because I was doing it all on my own. Um, so in that same case, in my personal life, if I was trying to overcome old lies, my flesh would just then go right back to the same guys, the same dating, the same, the, those same words that like always haunt, you know, hindered my confidence would just continue to attack as much as I would read self-help books or, you know, say positive things about myself. It's like, it's a stronghold. That's why it's called a stronghold because it's strong. And there's no way that we can break through that without God's strength. And um, it's really disappointing, you know, the, the society we live in right now, because 
everything you see. And honestly, even from Christian leaders, sometimes it's like self-care and self this <laughs> and, Let's and go. Self, you, you can do it, you know? And yes, I think there's a place for that, but there's a place for that when the Holy Spirit and the Lord is also combined. Because you can't just sit around and be like, God help, like save me from myself. Like you, you, you do have to take action. Of course. You know, like I couldn't overcome, you know, my old <laughs> dating patterns or, or dating the same guys if I didn't actually like try to date different guys. <laughs> sure. Um, and rather than just sitting there, you know, in my living room, like, okay, God, any day now, I'd like my husband. Um, you know, it's like we have to take action. But trust in the process and and trust that the Lord's strength is way far more um, magnificent, I guess you could say, than our own strength. You know why? And and I love that you're saying this because even to to wrap this point around regarding soul care and self-care and all this, I believe the reason it doesn't touch the deepest root is because it doesn't recognize that the deepest part of us is spirit, not soul. And the broken spirit, the Bible says, governs the soul. And so that broken spirit is defeated in and of itself. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Astrid just joined the conversation. This is fun. We're just going to keep this live. It's all good. So for those of you watching on YouTube right now, Desiree's little boy, Astrid just popped in. It's fun. Hey, let's just roll with it. It's good. It's, this is real life, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. So today, um, I, all honesty, I, you know, it's been a busy week and I had forgotten that I had a Monday interview because I usually Ah. do them on Tuesdays. Um, and Asher wanted to join me at work and, you know, I was like, okay, it's fine. Um, so if he pops in, it is what it is. <laughs> this is the real deal. And so it's all good. He's welcome to join. But uh, hey, Desiree, I actually want to stay where we are, but look through the lens of your story. I want to walk your story sure. back and talk about rejection. I have been hearing from more people that the roots of rejection are causing them to just run into a wall, so to speak. And the reason I want to start here is because rejection is so visceral for a lot of people. And I think your experience could validate the feelings of those listening. Take us back. Yeah. I mean, I think um, those feelings of rejection, I think for me personally, those feelings had stemmed from childhood. So mm-hmm. a lot of my childhood rejection and a lot of my feelings of um, just not being validated, you know, I, th- I think it's, yes, it's a small rejection, but those small rejections from those closest to you or maybe like neighborhood kids or your classmates, like it adds up. And so those little tiny rejections start to fill this, you know, fill your heart with even more rejection to where it dims your uh, worth. It dims Mm -hmm. your worth. And so I took that into dating whenever, you know, I liked a guy or started dating a guy, I would take on everything, um, and just like make it work. Um, Mm -hmm. and I would fight for something that wasn't right because I, I don't know, maybe it's like, I thought that's all I would get, or Mm -hmm. I just didn't want that rejection. So I was very, um, accommodating, very agreeable. You know what I mean? Like just kind of, I don't know who I am. So I just, but I, I, I want you and I'll do what you want, you know, that type of thing. And it's very unattractive actually, but, um, I was still confident. I wasn't like a super passive, but it's it still, it hindered a lot of my feelings of myself. And, um, and then obviously you, I go on the show and it, my rejection is, you know, public um, sure. for everyone to scrutinize, but really it was just like, it finally just came to a climax. Mm -hmm. All of those rejections from past hurts, past relationships, um, childhood, past everything had led up to the rejection that was on The Bachelorette when Brooks went home. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't even necessarily him going home. I think it was just so much of the buildup Mm -hmm. and me just getting so upset that I fell for it again. And then I was rejected. And so... I don't know. I think rejection is kind of 
it has, it's like an onion, you know, there's lots of layers to rejection. Um, some people it causes, you know, depression or it can cause like insecurities or it can cause, um, it, for me, you know, feeling unworthy. And so I had to really work on that and try to, uh, to overcome that. And there's a sticking point that I want to, I want to give to people right now, because you said regarding your own rejection, Hey, that's super unattractive, but <laughs> I'd actually like to say in a dysfunctional relationship, it actually is in an unhealthy way, super attractive because when you have a guy who is a rescuer, hmm. what does a rescuer look to do? Rescue someone who is inherently rejected or feeling abandoned. And that level of codependency in and of itself is, is dysfunctional. It, it even yeah. takes me back to how you wrote in your book um, early on in childhood with your brother when, yeah. uh, when he was saying, hey, I want this or I want that. And you're like, yeah, that works for me too. Yeah. It's a level of yeah. agreeableness. And um, I, I'd love to know behind that for you, behind the rejection, Oftentimes we unintentionally make I am statements or I am not statements. There's a, there's a, a faulty belief that's, that's fueling that. What was it for you? What were you saying? What was the belief statement behind the feelings of rejection? Um, you know, to be completely honest, I'm not sure exactly. I think it's just because ironically I was confident in who I was, oh. but for some reason there was just this under, almost like an underlying like heart, it was a heart thing. Cause I, I mean, I was confident in like dating or like whatnot, maybe because I was confident in like my interest. I was confident in, you know, myself, just, I had those wounds that would come up occasionally mm -hmm. and that would create insecurities. Um, I think for me, it's just, I am maybe not enough it was, or I was, I was either not enough or I was too much because I was so sensitive. So because I was so sensitive, I often was too sensitive. Mm -hmm. And because when people start to tell you you're sensitive, you start to take on that I am. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, well, describe yourself, I will still say I am sensitive, but now I can say I'm sensitive and that is a strength. Whereas before, it was a negative and I, I couldn't understand, you know, cause I'm, I, I care, I'm compassionate and that's the strength of being sensitive. But early on in life, it was brought up to my attention to be a negative. And so I carried that on into like so much of, um, so in my twenties, actually, I was very, very, very close. Like I had a wall, like I would not cry you couldn't even, you could break uh, up with me and I wouldn't even show you. And I wouldn't show any emotion. I would never let anyone see me cry because then I was being weak and I was being, mm, you know, mm -hmm. not strong. And, um, but then I would go home and I could go in my closet and cry for a day. You know what I mean? I was just like kind of hiding that part of me because I was embarrassed by it. And I felt like I couldn't show emotion because the, it, when I was little, if I showed emotion, I'd get made fun of. So it was kind of one of those things that just continued on into my adult life. And then um, I went on the show. So what, even on The Bachelor, I would say I was very, still very strong in terms of like not showing emotion. Like I didn't even cry when I got sent home because oh. of the relationship. It was more so because I couldn't afford anything. And I was like, oh no, what am I doing? But um it was when the bachelorette really broke me down and kind of um, opened up the floodgates, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. um, with with just letting it all out there. And and my true sensitivities came out. And so, but I'm thankful you, for that. Do you think that was because the roles were sort of reversed? In other words, when you were on The Bachelor, you were amidst, I don't know how many number of other women, but then on The Bachelorette, it's you. Yeah, so it puts your heart in a different place. It puts your heart in a different place, but you're also carrying, like, I'm an empath. I was carrying other people's emotions too. And, and the oh. pressure to be this person that I, you know, I wasn't like, I'm an introvert. I need space. Mm -hmm. And I was being overwhelmed with the, the schedule, the lack of sleep, um, the dating. It, it was hard on, on me. Um, 
and then spiritually too, you know, you, you don't have time to be, to have that rest, Mm -hmm. to really clear your mind and your heart. And so it was overwhelming for me. It was very overwhelming. Um, but dealing with all that emotion did break me from caring about my emotions. You know, I'm like, I don't even care. I will just, I couldn't even, I'd cry just because I was tired, you know, Mm -hmm. And there's cameras everywhere. So of course they're going to capture that emotion. (laughs) It almost, it magnifies the things that we already have going in our own psyche and in our soul. I, I ask this not to uh, put you on blast because I actually tend to be this way in relationships too. Are you a fixer? Cause I am, I love to go fix it mode. Yeah. I totally always used to be, Mm. um, I think that's why I ended up with guys that were emotionally unavailable because I loved that. I'm like, Oh, I, you know, I don't think when I met them, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to fix them. But I think once I'm in the relationship and I want it to work, then I will do what it needs to be done to make it work. Wild, Yes. Yeah. That's really interesting. Well, it's really interesting that kind of tipping our hat to this because I'd love to know, for you to just speak to the listener and the viewer here, what advice would you have for people who have been accustomed then to overextending themselves to a partner and receiving, as you said, crumbs of affection? I can't remember which relationship you were describing when you wrote that in the book. Um, yeah. So in that relationship, I think also in another relationship, I just happened to meet the same kind of guys. I was attracted to the same kind of guys is yeah. that because they were emotionally unavailable and I was, you know, so confident in keeping us together, I would give my all. And so I'm, I was continually filling their buckets with love and receiving nothing in return in my bucket. So my bucket just ran dry. And then when it runs dry, it creates insecurities. It creates this feeling of longing. It creates a void that if you're seeking the attention of another person, that void can't be fixed because I learned, you know, you got to turn to God and he will Mm -hmm. fill that void. Mm -hmm. But in my twenties, I wasn't doing that. You know, I'm like, I just need his attention, his love. Um, and then I was just empty and I was just expecting it to shift or expecting my relation, my boyfriends to like fill my bucket. And they just aren't, weren't capable of doing that. And, um, it, 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 it didn't, it took me Till I started to get back into my faith to realize just how much I deserve and how much I don't deserve. And so if a guy couldn't fill my bucket per se, or pursue me, then he wasn't worthy of my love. And it, but it took me discovering God's love to really understand that and to put it into action and walk away from a relationship that I was really excited about but I just knew it wasn't going to work out. And I was only able to walk away because I had God's love. And I knew I was loved by God because we all have God's love, but knowing it and believing it and receiving it is different. Back to identity. We either work for love or work from love and you can only give people what you have. And so it's, it's sort of obvious how relationships then play out when we're, loving from the identity of already being loved. Yes. Healthy dynamics tend to kind of work themselves out. Yeah, that's so good. It's so true. I'd love to know just, you know, in the process of your relationships and obviously you've dated in front of millions of people, which is a wild, (laughs) wild concept. And we'll talk about that later. (laughs) Um, what did healing after a very difficult breakup look like for you? I, I'd love to, again, just ask you to talk to the listener, to the viewer, because I think your advice would be really helpful for people to hear, doesn't yeah, it? You know, so so you'll learn more about it in my book, but I yeah. had um, gotten back into my faith and then I, I knew that this relationship wasn't going to work. So I had to walk away, um, but it was very, very, very hard, like very hard. Um, mm-hmm because it was mainly just the faith thing and also just (laughs) him being more emotionally unavailable. But, um, what I, what I learned and what I shifted my mind to and my heart to was that instead of me 
just waiting and, and being like, God, send me my husband. Like I'm ready for my husband. Give me my husband, give me my husband. Instead of thinking that, like thinking, Oh me, I need my husband now. I shifted my prayers and I shifted my mind to praying for my husband's heart. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know when I would meet him, but I started to shift my mind to like, you know, I don't want to date these guys again. I don't want to fall for this again. So I started to pray that my husband's heart would be prepared for me when he met me. And um, it's funny that I can pray that. And I, I thought that for a year and yet, when I went on the show, I still fell back into the same trap, (laughs) but Chris was that man because he, he never wavered. He was as strong as could be. He, he was ready. He was prepared and God had prepared him to be the strength that I needed uh, to overcome those same, you know, traps that I kept getting myself into. Mm. Well, it's really, it's really cool that you say that. So my pastor's um, their names are Dave and Ann Wilson. They host Family Life Today Radio. And um, one of the things they've always shared with me in the last few years is find someone who's running at the same speed as you. We're talking about in our spiritual walk or even a little faster. So you meet Chris on the show. And of course, you talk about how you met and um, the experience of seeing him get out of the limo on the show. In terms of Chris's walk with Jesus, w- was that parallel to yours as well? You know, I'm going to say no. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's totally fine. So he, he grew up, um, going to Catholic churches, or I'm sorry, he went to Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And so he, we had discussed faith on the show. They just don't air it, but we did discuss faith. And so, you know, I knew that he loved God, which was, wow, one step ahead of any other guy (laughs) I dated. And, um, he was so supportive. And so, cause we talked about, you know, morals and, and raising kids and what that would look like. This is even before we got engaged on the show. And so I knew that he had a heart of Jesus and that he Mm. had, you know, he had, he had those, those values and those morals that I, I valued in, in my family life and in, in raising children. And so I knew that we would align in the, in terms of morals and values Um, in terms of, the walk with Jesus and Christianity and, you know, just following God. I, I think I just grew up very charismatic, uh, Pentecostal. So, did? you know, I, yeah, so that's just, awesome. I did too. You know, yeah. So, you know, it's just a different, it's just different. I mean, I was like four, you know, <laughs> praising God, speaking in tongues. I, I'm we like, go after the fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. but that's like my world. And so, Yes, I got out of it a little bit when I was yeah. in my 20s, but when I was getting back into my faith, I was seeking him so fervently that um, I really wanted, you know, more and I wanted to know who God was, but I, I'm going to be very transparent. The yeah. show kind of set me back a little bit because mm. I was so overwhelmed with, with um, just everything. I was overwhelmed with a new relationship, but also overwhelmed with the attention and overwhelmed with opportunity that the opportunity kept me from staying, keeping my focus on God and keeping my focus on what he wanted for me. And it took a good three years after to finally be like, God, I can't do this. I'm burnt out. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. Yes. You gave me this platform, but I'm using it in my own way. Like show me how you need me to use this platform that you gave me. And it's embarrassing and sad to say it took me that long, but, but, um, but thank God I can see that and know like he, he had so much more in store, Mm -hmm. um, for me and for what, why he put me on the show, why he gave me this platform. And, um, and yeah, I don't know. So, so now I'm like on fire. I'm like, Ooh, I'm like, you know, I want to, there's a lot of things I'm doing because the Lord is, telling me to, and he's preparing me for so much more. And because of my walk with the Lord, living by example, Mm -hmm. Chris has been seeking more and more. It's beautiful. So, yeah. So I I wouldn't say we were like running at the same pace, but he's running after me. So if I'm running after Jesus and he's running after me, 
where do you think he's going to end up? Come on, Desiree. He's going to end up seeking Jesus and finding Jesus because I am. So all he has to do is keep his eyes on me. <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, he has to pr- be pursuing, you know, his wife to then see who I'm seeking. And, and I'm not going to say it's always easy because, you know, I think most women out there want to find a man that's strong in his faith. Mm-hmm. But I will also say like God puts fire in, uh, in women's hearts for a reason too, yeah. you know, like, and, and I have so much faith that, you know, whatever God's doing, it will be, we will be together. And the one thing is alignment though, an agreement. Yeah. So I, I have learned in marriage, like, and when you're dating, I think I did, if I knew this back then, it would have been so much better to, to understand the part of agreement. And, and when you're walking in difficult seasons, or if you're walking in good seasons, it's important to come together as a couple and, and pray, but also just in agreement with one another. It's really yeah. helpful. No, that's really helpful. And I think one of the things, um, obviously I don't know, Chris, but what I've seen and you know read about him in your book and guys listening, I want to remind you, because of course, you know, we read scripture and there's the Proverbs 31 woman, but what does the Bible say actually about a guy who can find a faithful man? Yeah. And one of the things I perceive about Chris is he has a teachable, tender spirit. That's huge. Absolutely. That's huge. And so even, even, um, girls listening, women listening right now that maybe you're a little discouraged. I want you to listen to what Desiree said about her relationship with Chris. A teachable spirit is a powerful, powerful tool, tool in the hand of the Lord. And so be encouraged if you're listening right now and just a little on the fence and frustrated or, um, even just praying. So be encouraged. So that's yeah, right. I want to go with, back. Go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Yeah, with, with that, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm like visual person. So with yeah. that, I, I thought of, you know, God is the potter and we are the clay. We need to be moldable. And, but, but what I had learned in other relationships is that I was trying to mold the other person. I was trying to bring salvation to the other person, or I was trying to fix the other person. But God is our maker. He's our creator. He's our potter. He's the only one that can mold us into who he wants us to be. And so with what's so wonderful too, is that with Chris, because I've learned that lesson Mm -hmm. now with Chris, I can just give it to God. Like I, he's seeking and I can just continue to pray, 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 pray without intervening my own opinions and intervening my own strength. And so it's truly just like praying um, and letting God, letting God lead. That's beautiful. Well, that's really beautiful. I want to go back in a little bit to talk about old lies. Cause I know people listening right now are going, okay, gosh, I have these encumbrances in my life and I want to break through them, but I have these old attachments, old lies. I'd love for you to talk about old lies and their effect on our present view of life. I think this is a core principle for us to learn today. Yeah. Like our present view. I mean, oh man. It's like lies lies create, lies create a lens. They 100%. And it's, Mm -hmm. and it's hard because when you're living those old lies and you're seeing them, you can't see the other side or you can't see like maybe a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so my old lies were always, you know, I mean, I struggled with self doubt, um, big time mm-hmm. and being a creative, I think that's normal, but also just that's where the enemy attacked a lot is self-doubt. Um, also like not having a voice, like your voice doesn't matter though. That's the old lie. And, um, that's a tough one because like, even when I was a little girl, you know, I, I let everyone speak for me or I just, I, I, I wasn't confident in my opinions. I wasn't confident that because I wanted to be liked and, I think I was just often made fun of. So if I said anything, of course, that's, you know, going to keep me from speaking um, if I'm not confident in what I'm saying. And so, yeah, not having a voice, not feeling worthy and validated. And I'm going to say like, I'm 35. I didn't, I didn't break some of those old lies till like a year ago when I could I, when I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. So it take, it takes time for some people and sometimes it's overnight, but, um, a lot of mine, I had to pray off the enemy. You know, I had to, I had to rip it from myself. Like 
And the first step is being aware of what those old lies are. Because we just live, we just live our day life. Like, like, I mean, I think I talk about it in the book, but one of the things I learned about myself wasn't until I got married and I was like, wow, I'm really stubborn. <laughs> you know, like, That's not an old lie, but that's just a personality trait. And um, I don't know, I think to, what, once I started identifying what the old lie was, I started to identify why I felt the way I did. So if, an instance, like my voice, like, why do I feel like I can't speak up for myself? Why do I feel like my voice doesn't matter? And the more I realized that it wasn't from God, that it was actually the enemy's attempt to keep me silent, mm -hmm. I was able to have the tools to overcome because I identified where it was coming from. And the tool was the word of God Let's speaking go. life into myself yeah. and binding the enemy from my voice and releasing it. Like, I kid you not, like, I mean, I'm going to get a little spiritual, but for years I felt this like heaviness around my neck. Like I would walk into a spirit filled church and my, I would feel like the tingling, which was like, I, I, I mean, it was like a, it was like a spirit over my voice, you know, like yep. keeping me from feeling um, like I could use it and where the enemy hits us the most is where God is going to use us to build his kingdom. So now that I have overcome that, I can be on my podcast and I can give messages. I can talk to someone on the street about God and not feel that shame or that, that like, oh my God, I'm not good enough, you know? So it's just, it's just a, a freedom. It's freedom when we can um, overcome those old lies, overcome all of those things that the devil wants to keep us down. There's freedom. There's freedom to be had in every area. Addiction, a huge one. Anxiety. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are plagued with anxiety we and we take pills for it, but mm -hmm. anxiety does not come from God. Like that's not from God. Right. It's from us too, wanting to control things. So mm -hmm. once we can surrender to God, like you will see things fall off of you just like one by one. I, I prayed for, because I always felt a little shy in my voice, I prayed for boldness and I prayed for boldness for six years hmm. because I, it was a struggle. And so I would just continue to pray for boldness. Like, God, I will not be ashamed. Like, please, I pray for boldness to like, talk to my friends, talk to my family, use my platform that you have given me, give me boldness. And I mean, <laughs> you know, that's things you still have to pray for. Um, but if you can identify it and know where it comes from, you can overcome it. If you can identify <laughs> it, you can overcome it. Now, if this is so good, guys, I want to remind you. So many of you are saying, oh, gosh, I didn't know it had a, a root of perhaps spiritual origin. Well, the Bible says in Ephesians, guys, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but get, but against principalities and, and powers in every yeah. high, high place. And so, there is a spiritual root to that. Now, we've talked about anxiety here on the show, guys. How does anxiety manifest? Well, often, as Desiree just said, when you feel out of control, I'd like to propose also when you feel disconnected and when you feel unsafe. Mm. So what do we do with that? Well, we have to recognize that. So Desiree, you said regarding these old lies and, and, and roots of dysfunction, perhaps, that the first step was to recognize them, to be able to identify them. For you, step two would be what? knowing the origin okay and then so step three. That, then step three is um i guess defining it like Good. you That's know good. you're defining because a lot of times things can be morphed too where you're like oh i think it's anxiety and depression but then maybe it's an underlining piece of trauma from your childhood yeah. so it's not necessarily what you think it is it's mm -hmm. something deeper that you need to be that you need to take hold of. Mm -hmm. um, so defining it for sure. And then, um, and then what, whatever it is that you defined, finding scripture in the Bible to overcome it, like, like specific scripture to overcome it. Okay. We are knocking on a door that needs to open here guys, because we've been talking about this a lot on the show and, and this is why willpower driven self-help helps 
but does not give us hope for long-term long transformation. So Desiree, when we recognize the origin of these things, and again, we, we go into the word and find answers to the problems that ail us, how do you apply the word so that the word works? Because guys, this is the word in, at, in and of itself is sufficient to fulfill the power therein, but we have to apply it. We have to submit ourselves to it. Like seed in soil, we have to take the seed of the word of God and plant it in the soil of our heart. So Desiree, when you find the origin of these hindrances, encumbrances in your own life, and you find solutions in the word of God, what does applying the word of God look like for you? Uh, for me personally, in my own mm -hmm. life, um, to be completely honest, I worship music. So mm -hmm. when I, like music speaks to us and it speaks to us for a reason. Yeah. And so when I was struggling with like identity issues of my worth, um, which, you know, in different seasons, it was a different sense of worth. So like, mm -hmm. You know, in relationships, it was more about, you know, whatever, am I good enough? And then motherhood hit another like identity crisis. And, and then there, there's just all these things. So whenever I hit these crises, mm -hmm. crises, um, I would turn on the songs that spoke life to me that like you, you know, like I am who you say I am. Mm -hmm. And I would just blast it on repeat and repeat and repeat because songs are prayers so those songs and those worship songs that we sing, those are prayers going up to heaven because we are singing them with our heart. And so the more I was just repeating those songs of like you say by Lauren Daigle or yeah. the I am who you say I am, yeah, I was starting to be affirmed in who God created me to be. Like mm. he loved me. I am who he says I am, not what others say I am. I'm not even sometimes what, you know, my family says I am because that's stemming from, you know, being too sensitive. Like, no, God says who I am and I am going to identify with what he says I am. And so I would then take the scripture and you just honestly memorize it, memorize it, memorize that's it, it. Yes. memorize it and say it over and over and over again. And every time you feel anxiety kick in, anytime you feel fear kick in, you say that scripture and you defeat it by that way, but you have to know when it's kicking in because just like an, you know, a battle, like you have a better chance. If you know, when the enemy's coming, you have a much better chance. If you, if they are already at the front line, you have to work harder. So wherever you are at with say, as we keep talking about anxiety, if you have triggers of anxiety, where are they stemming from? And how can you stop it before it gets too, too tough, too hard? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's super helpful. No. If we could, I'd love to go back into the topic of relationships and it, it just kind of bring this full circle uh, to go back inside your story. You described a guy named Andrew and it was instant chemistry off the bat, <laughs> hot and steamy from the get go. <laughs> But you wrote that he was emotionally unavailable and closed off. Here's the question then, because that's infatuation. What is love? You're married and you're a mom now. Yeah. Yeah. Love is steadfast. It is rooted. It's rooted and um, it's secure and it's, and it's easy. So in all my other relationships, I felt like, oh, you know, love is supposed to be hard. Like we're supposed to have this the hot chemistry, but then like struggle, <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then I learned it's easy. You're friends, you're friends and you care for one another and you run towards each other, not run towards your own goals. You run towards the goals together. And yeah, love is allowing someone to pursue you. Cause I also was a super independent woman. And I think deep down I needed to like take care of myself and I can do this, you know? Um, but I think it's something I'm also learning even in this time of my life is, is receiving. So receiving love for some people can be difficult. And I think the more I, I, I dwell on that topic of receiving, I realize like that might be me. Like, I, I think I struggled with 
receiving love because of those old lies. But also I think if I can't receive it, then I will never feel it because I constantly need to be validated. And so it's something that I'm also working on. Mm. But if you're in a relationship and you're struggling or he is pursuing you and he's like the most perfect guy ever, like, are you receiving that love? Or are you just putting up a wall because of old lies? Because that's what I did. I met someone right before the show that was very similar to Chris mm. and um, probably perfect, you know, with like, you know, on the list of characters. Checking the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. But again, the pursuing me was a little like too much because I just wasn't used to it. Hmm. And um, I couldn't receive it because I wasn't yet ready. God didn't yet strengthen my heart and my spirit to know that that is what I deserved. Mm -hmm. And you deserve it too. Like everyone deserves to feel loved, but we also have to know how to receive that love. Oh, that's really helpful. So you said love is easy. I want to push back on that just a little bit. Okay. Because I want to, well, I want to, I want to hear Not what easy. that really means. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's good because relationships are hard. Relationships, relationships take work. Marriage yeah. is hard. Now I, I I'm single. So I'm saying that as someone who is like, I don't have a clue what marriage is like, okay. but in, as a pastor and working with people and helping people, of course, I step into these conflicts. So we know relationships, even platonic relationships, guys, re yeah. relationships take work. But you said love is easy. Can you either okay. draw the line and help us understand what you meant by that? Yes, I think you just already answered your own question because okay. love is easy. Relationships are hard because we okay. are humans. We are broken people. And we each bring in our baggage and we mm -hmm. each bring in our personality traits and we each bring in, you know, conflict, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 I guess the logistics and like the relationship aspect is hard mm -hmm. because sometimes we don't, we're fighting our own flesh. Sometimes we're okay. fighting the other person because we just don't want to hear what they're saying. And so, and we have different viewpoints sometimes of like how things need to be done. And so that's hard. It's mm -hmm. hard, mm -hmm. but the love, the heart, the heart love is easy. So for Chris, like I had never experienced that, like steadiness and that, that just like strong love of like, I've got you, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a loyalty and um, a security. So the love is always there. So when you have the easy love, the heart feelings, it makes the relationship work better because you're not going to just run away because you have that rooted love. So, uh, yeah. So I would say in all the other relationships I ever had, it was never a rooted love. It maybe was also a, um, a, uh, what am I trying to say? Like a self-inflicted love. Like I, you know, infatuation, infatuation. Got it. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. There's a difference between lust and love. And, there it is. And, and then there's a difference between love and rooted love. Okay. Then, well, as a follow-up to that, I want to know what drives hookup culture today. Oh gosh. Instant gratification, mm. satisfaction, validation. Just the swipe all the things, yeah. you know, we, we live in a world where we want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want to be loved. Mm -hmm. So if someone's going to give us just an, even an ounce of affection, we, 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 um, mistake that for love and we mistake hookups for love mm -hmm. because we think like, Oh, the, Oh, he loves, he, he likes me and he's going to, you know, continue dating me. It's like, you just gave him everything, you know, <laughs> that he wants. And so Move it's, on. yeah, it's yeah. very dangerous. It's, it's a very dangerous hmm. thing to get wrapped up into. And I know from personal experience, yeah, I know from personal experience that, you know, the hookup culture will keep you from finding the one because each time you hook up, it's creating, it creates more insecurities within your soul, within your spirit. It starts to break down your spirit. It starts to break down your worth. It starts to break down everything that, 
God wants you to feel about yourself, Mm -hmm. it continues to break it down. And so, I don't know. I would encourage, I just encourage, I encourage people to wait um, because, yeah, otherwise you have to struggle with, with lies, old lies. Back to the, yes. Back (laughs) Back to the old lies. Yeah. I don't know. It's really helpful. Ash has got a question for mom. (laughs) Oh, he's making paper. That's awesome. From the printer. (laughs) This is probably, this is one of the most fun interviews I've had because of the interaction. Oh, really? Yeah. It's just, it's real life guys. It's real yeah. life. Well, it's really good to, to see this side off the camera because life is just not veneer. No, and not it's, at all. it's really helpful to, to see this. Um, Desiree, I got to ask this question. Cause I asked Ben Higgins this question too. And guys, uh, as you heard in the teaser, uh, this week is uh roses week here on win today. So today we've got, Desiree, on Wednesday, you'll hear my conversation with Ben Higgins, The Bachelor. But I asked Ben this question, Desiree. What in the world is it like to date on television? (laughs) Um, It's different. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You know, to be honest, it didn't bother me, um, like the cameras and stuff, because I just kind of zoned it out. Um, I don't know. I don't even know. It's just so weird. <laughs> you zoned it out. Which interesting. Ben had a Ben. Ben was like, gosh, they're always there. So it's really interesting I, to hear yeah, your flip on that. Yeah. You know, I think I just didn't care um, because I'm like, I didn't want to be on TV. I, I, it wasn't who I am. Mm-hmm. So it was just a great opportunity that the Lord opened for me. And so I think I just was so, it was so easy for me to just be like, all right, whatever you got in store for me, I take it. And I also never fought like the editing. I never fought because I was like, you know, I prayed that glory, glory be to God. And, you know, people can think what they wanted about every episode, but I I naturally have a very relaxed personality. So I think it was just easy for me to be like, okay, well, they're going to edit it how they're going to edit it. So I can just be myself. And I also wanted to meet someone who knew me for myself and not as like a, you know, like glamorized person, because that's not who I am. Like, right. It's not who I am. So I, I just didn't care about how I looked or anything. I was just kind of wild. That's wild. Like, let's do it. Okay. I wonder if, and I, I know nothing about the mechanics that drive producers to make decisions, but I wonder if you know, part of that here, you auditioned for the bachelor, but then you were chosen as the bachelorette. I mean, how, how did that play out? That's fascinating. Yeah. You know, it was just, I think they asked like a lot of the last remaining, like the final four, if they would be interested. Okay. And, um, at first I was like, I don't know, that was kind of a weird thing (laughs) to go through. And I was super broke and I knew I needed to work, Yep. but I also knew that the lead got paid. So I was like, you know, this would be a great opportunity to, to get me out of my, my, uh, my debt and, and it would be fun. Maybe I'd meet the right guy. And so I was like, you know, it could be worth a shot. And so that's why here's Chris. And then it was worth a shot. That's awesome. Well, hey, talking about you and Chris, I mean, Chris's and your communication styles are really different. You talked about that in the book. How did those differences make themselves known in engagement and then in marriage? And now Asher's sitting right next to you as parents. Um, It's actually still something we have to work on. Yeah. Um, Because there's those, we're like ingrained. The communication is like ingrained in us in a way. Mm -hmm. And so- like we talked about old, overcoming old lies, it yeah. takes work to overcome yeah. those communication things because we learn from our families. We learn from those around us. It's like ingrained in us. And, and I didn't, I didn't come from a communicative family. And so it's very difficult for me to bring up conflict, bring up anything really that's like, I don't know, worth it. Sometimes I'm like, is it even worth it? You know? Or am I just, you know, I can handle it on my own, which is also a fault. I want to handle it on my own. I'll just be like, I can handle this. Um, 
And I would say that we first identified our communication styles very early on uh, because when you add stress to a relation, like work stress. So say like, you know, we come off of the show and then we both go in straight into our work stuff. And then I had stresses from just the attention and, and stresses from the opportunities. But then he had stress from just a busy, stressful work day. Hmm. And then you bring two stressful people together and you realize very quickly sure. what your differences are in communication. And luckily for me, he's a very communicative person and he wants to squash things right away. Whereas I'm like, oh my God, what just happened? I need to go think about it. And then I need to like write down what my thoughts were. And then I need to, yeah. and then I need to be able to be like, why did I feel that way? And then I can come back to you and be like, this is why I feel this way. Um, so very different. Um, I, I have a, a auto responsive crying mm. to any type of tone that's higher than what I prefer and mm. any conflict, just uh, auto response. Like, and it's, I think also just not liking cri criticism. Mm -hmm. um, I learned I had to work on trying to accept constructive criticism without it be, taking it personally. Mm -hmm. And that's where being too sensitive comes in, but that's okay. I work working through it. Well, I like what you said earlier in our conversation, because sensitivity is a gift. Yes. But, and guys, I just want to echo this to you that any strength overextended and under stress becomes a liability to our ability to cope with the demands of everyday life. And so, um, Desiree, any other thoughts about that and even advice for the listeners uh, today about managing these, these aspects of our temperament in relationship yeah. dynamics? You know, I think we have to realize what our expectations are of another person. Mm. So in relationships and not, and in honestly, in every relationship, in friendships, in, in professional relationships, we, ha we put these expectations on other people of how they should respond, of how they should talk or, or what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And those expectations usually stem from how we would do it. And so it's not a great perspective. Because then we're just assuming everyone's walking around like us, which would be a very boring, you know, world. And so we have to take away those expectations and how you do that is with grace. Mm. Like, I'm not going to lie. I have to tell Chris sometimes, like, give me grace because I, we just are different people. Um, I, sure. you know, he, his sense of urgency is like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And I'm more of like, you know, things get done. And I, I'm not going to stress myself out to get these things done. So sometimes we have to extend grace to other people to know that they are different. Mm -hmm. and they don't think like us. And so they will not communicate like us either. So if you can give grace to, to understand, maybe this person communicates this way. I communicate this way. How can we have a compromise? That's good. Yeah, because it's like, I know like now how I need to speak to Chris and Chris now knows the things to say to me, you know, to, mm -hmm. to where it's not conflict and it's constructive and we're getting somewhere, you know, we're not just hurting each other's feelings. Mm. And so I don't know. I I've learned that through the years. I didn't always know that. So if you guys are listening, like it takes time to understand that, but yeah. When you see your other person, yeah, like your partner, you just can't expect that they, uh, they know everything that's in your head either, or, or that they're going to respond the way you expect them to respond. Yeah. That's really good guys. Win today.tv slash episode 251. Get a copy of Desiree's brand new book. It's available right now. Desiree in your season finale, you and Chris are standing there. It's the moment of engagement, moment of engagement. You said, I feel like I was blindsided by my feelings that I couldn't see the one thing that I always needed was right in front of me. That is so true for a lot of us in various domains of life. Number one, why? Number two, how does that statement still ring true for you in life? Oh my, again, it's perspective. Yeah. Um, when we're in something and we believe so strongly in something, we cannot see the red flags. We can't see the mm -hmm. things that are keeping us from fulfilling a bigger, you know, destiny or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what, what was the question of 
how to overcome that? More or less, how does it still ring true in your life today? You know, why, why is that so important for us to understand that a lot of the things that we want, that we desire, that we need are right in front of us, yet we don't have the ability to see it because old lies are distracting us. Old lies are lenses, guys, like we talked about earlier in the conversation. These various encumbrances and dysfunctions are creating a lens through which we're looking and we miss what's right in front of us, the very thing we need. You know, for me personally, that's the receiving. So the receiving of the love. So Chris may like do things here and there that show his love, but I'm just not receiving it because it's not maybe the way that I want to like hear it. And so that also in it, in itself is me just letting my feelings keep me from like my old self, keep me from feeling the love yep. of Chris. And so um, I mean, even with business, I feel like there's so many things you, you do that again, you're doing in your own will. So when you're doing it in your own will, you're kind of veiled from, mm -hmm. from what you, what God wants to do in your life. So it's kind of like, you're, you know, it's the same type of thing. You're, you can't see you're blind, you're blinded yeah. because sometimes we just, it's, you have the ability to overcome it, but so often you don't know that until you seek a different perspective but a lot of people can't see that they need to do that does that make sense it totally does yeah it totally yeah. does what a great place to land this plane and again guys desiree's brand new book win today.tv slash episode 251 in the show notes is a link to purchase this copy desiree i gotta tell you this has been such a fun enlivening conversation for me is there anything else you want to share with the listeners or leave with us uh, no, I know. I think that's good. I feel like I covered a bunch of stuff, but so, I always love talking about, you know, things that I have learned, especially when it comes to dating, especially in this world of uh, those who are single and trying to just navigate those waters. It's difficult. And I just, all I can hope is that I can bring hope and encouragement from my, my experiences. Well, that you have, and uh, I'm just so grateful. How can people stay connected with you? You guys can follow me over on Instagram at Desiree Siegfried or on my website, DesireeSiegfried.com. Beautiful. Sounds good. Desiree, can't thank you enough. Thank you for being yes, here today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.